Last week we looked at the fulfillment of the law, that is chapter 5 verse 17 onwards, where Jesus talks about how he came to fulfill the law and not to abolish the law because it was a popular opinion of the religious leaders who thought that Jesus was doing something different, that he was against the Mosaic law, right, that Moses gave, through Moses God gave, and somehow that he was against those things. And Jesus said, no, I came to fulfill the law. And he also made a statement that not even a letter, not even a small stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So he definitely sets the law on a higher plane. He is not disrespectful of the law, but he is also wanting them to understand that the first century, we need to understand that the, during the intertestamental period, there is something called the Talmud, that which has come into existence. Torah is the Old Testament law, which is, which we find in Genesis to Deuteronomy, which is also called the law, the Torah, which was very important, which is what God directly gave to the people. But what happened was in between this, this intertestament period after the Babylonian captivity, the rabbis took the upper hand and they said, you cannot interpret the scriptures, we will interpret it for you. And therefore, you don't have to follow the Torah, you follow the teachings that we give about the Torah, which were called the Talmud. We've talked about this, right. So here Jesus is saying, I want you to go back to the ideals that God gave. And the ideals of God, the, the commandments of God, are basically a reflection of his principles, the nature, his ideals that God had in his heart and mind, okay? And he wants us to come back to that. And with that, last week we looked at where he says, do not murder, where it is not just about murder, it is about accusing or abusing people with your words or hurting people deliberately and then he would say if you are that person it's better that you apologize it's better that you leave your gift right there at the altar even before you sacrifice because you are the perpetrator and never ever think that you are going to reconcile with God if you definitely know that you are the perpetrator and you have not mended that relationship we talked about that and then Jesus goes on so look in your look into your Bibles Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 onwards, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And here Jesus is reminding them, reiterating what was already told in the Old Testament. This is a, this is a law that we need to understand. What is this all about? God is saying, if you are in a covenant relationship, never be unfaithful. Adultery is wrong because it breaks the covenant that was made between the husband and the wife. You know, today we need to understand that culture as it's moving, as it is moving forward, and you know, we become more progressive as we say, but we need to understand that relationships, and especially covenant relationships, are not meant to be broken. And this is very, very important. And uh, there are many aspects of the covenant, according to the Bible, where it is about companionship. If you know Genesis, you would know that the relationship that God made possible in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve was this. It was a relationship where companionship was there, where there was complementariness. These are things that Christians don't talk about today. Even in weddings, you know, when we go to the uh, Christian wedding, you know what people say, you know, why is this man and woman coming together so that they can? bring up godly children. It's basically for procreation. No, it is not only for that. It is about companionship. It's about complementariness. And obviously the conjugal relationship is definitely there, but adultery is something that is considered very serious because this is what breaks the covenant. All the other things could be mended. You're not a good companion, yeah, that could be mended. You are, not a very, you are not a person who completes the other person, yeah, that could be mended in your behavior, in your nature, you could work on that. But adultery is something that cannot be mended and Jesus is saying, the Old Testament is very, very specific there where it says, you cannot do that, it is a sin. In the covenant relationship that you are in, may God help us that we will never become unfaithful partners in the relationship that God has put in. Hallelujah. That we will always be faithful. And it is a little bit interesting to see that um, in the Old Testament, the word adultery was uh, used in you know, its kind of double standards. A man could marry many women. He could even have concubines. And that was not considered adultery. Okay, You would be saying, oh, I did not know that. Right. So this is not for us, the Hebrew people. Okay. What was adultery for them was that a man, a married man, he 
forces himself upon a married woman, okay, a Hebrew married woman, and then it is called adultery. But for a woman, it is basically anything outside her marriage, it's basically adultery. So that was double standards, okay? But why the law of adultery that you should not commit adultery is given is that there will not be any victimization. Because in adultery, what happens is one person breaks the covenant and the other person who has not done anything wrong actually becomes the victim. And God, all the laws always stand for the victim that it will not condone any such behavior where you become the exploiter. You understand that? So we need to understand that in a covenant relationship that it is very important that it is not about where marriage is not about as what it is today. It's become a business, right? Because marriage has become a business where it is always about the financial transaction which makes it God's will or not. <laughs> right? So you know what? I... I have my engineering degree, so it's basically, not me, okay, I'm just saying about you, all right. So engineering, obviously, you should get, I don't know, today's uh, market value, <laughs> maybe 50 lakh, maybe I'm, I'm talking about something less, okay. So if you have a BTH, you know, even theologically, it's like that, if you have a BTH, maybe you can sell yourself for 10 lakhs. <laughs> maybe if you have an MTH, maybe it's a little more. It's a business transaction. And you know, there is an industry called the wedding or the marriage industry now, just like food industry, okay, where it's about extravaganza. It's about, you know, lavish spending. It's about a status symbol. You know, I had the grandest wedding. It's not about that. It's about the covenant relationship. And you need to be very careful that you never, ever break it because this, God consider it, considers it to be victimization. You, you become the perpetrator, and once it's almost like this, you maim somebody, okay? You maim somebody. You know what maiming is? You maybe, you know, in your anger, you hit somebody, and that person has lost a faculty. He could maybe monetarily compensate for that, but what is done is done. You have victimized some, somebody, and therefore, be very careful that you do not victimize people, especially people in their covenant relationship with you. So God is saying this is very important. And he is not just talking about that. He's not just talk, he's stopping there because this is an obvious thing that has already been taught in the Old Testament. And Jesus always goes from the obvious to not so obvious. You know, everybody knew murder was wrong, but people did not think that hurting people was wrong, right? And Jesus would say, as much as murdering is wrong, the same way, calling somebody raka or a fool because you want to put them down, because you want to deliberately hurt them and see them squirm, that is also equal to murder. And just like adultery is wrong, Jesus would also say, look at that, verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Anybody got married without... Uh, you know, no attraction at all, that would mean that's forced marriage, right? It's basically that not a marriage at all, right? Attraction is there. That's, that's physical. God has put it in your body. But at the same time, he's not talking about, okay, you are an unmarried person. You say, okay, maybe it's good that I get married to that person. Yeah, take the right way of doing things. But here he's talking about something called lust. Lust is not just, you know, saying I need it or I want it. Maybe it'll be better if I have that in life. But lust is more than that. Lust is when I say means do not matter. The person does not matter. My satiation, me being satisfied, me enjoying the person or whatever it is, is more important. So the means don't matter. The person him, her, herself or himself doesn't matter. You objectify a person. This is definitely wrong according to what Jesus is saying. Always, you know, this has become prevalent today. We have learned to love things and therefore we are not able to love people. You know, we are supposed to use things, but we love things, right? So when the next time you say, I love something, just rethink it, okay? Because things are, things are supposed to be used and people are supposed to be, you're confused there? Loved, okay? Things are not supposed to be loved. People are supposed to be loved. 
Things are supposed to be used. People are not supposed to be used, right? When you get that, then it makes sense. Jesus is saying, never use another person as an object for you to satiate yourself, to satisfy yourself. And Jesus is saying, that is definitely wrong. So may God help us that especially young people, you know, having an interest in somebody, you know, is okay as far as you know how you're going to handle it as far as you take the right way of doing it, right? But at the same time, don't do this Tamil kind of dialogue, Tamil cinema kind of dialogue, where you bet and say, you know what? In 15 days, I'm going to make that person fall in love with me. That means that person has no say in anything at all. That person is an object. I want to attain her, I want to attain him. By hook or crook, I will do that. You know that, what that is? That is what Jesus is talking about. Lust. Never ever do that. Never objectify people. Why this happens is that because we don't have this ideology. We don't have the understanding that everybody is equal. That everybody is worth. Everybody is a person. You know many religions do not teach this. And that is why religion, culture, they condone forced marriages. They condone rape is okay. You know because the person, the other person is just an object. You know, that is the ideology. Jesus always teaches, God always teaches, the Bible always teaches. You can never objectify, make another person, look at another person as though they are objects for you to satisfy yourself. Here, Jesus is saying this, especially in support of the women, because as I told you, in the Jewish culture, you know, a woman was basically, in most ancient cultures, a woman was basically a property of the man. Okay, you understand that? Either he, she belonged to the father first, and when this man, the man who was supposed to get married, he goes and gives a bride price. You know how that worked? You do not know. You know only dowry, right? Because dowry is biblical. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> bride price. Where the man, he goes to the woman's household and he says, you know, because one person being, you know, you losing one person from the family actually affects you economically, because the more people there, the more work gets done. So a lot of people, economy is booming. You understand that? It's the inverse today, right? You have many people in your family. I mean, you have too many children, then it's like you have to live in poverty. It's the other way around then, right? You have many people, and that is why, you know, having huge families was considered a blessing because everybody was bringing in income. Everybody was working. So this guy comes and says, you know, I want to get married to this girl. And he is going to take this girl to his own home. And it becomes a, what? An asset for that family that she goes to. And therefore, he has to compensate by pay paying a price. Saying, you know what? You are losing one person. You're losing that job. There. You are losing that uh, income through that person. So we're going to pay to you so that... You know, everything is okay. So she becomes a possession, basically, just like dowry. You know, the man becomes the possession, right? No, that never happens, right? <laughs> yeah, you bought me for 50 lakhs, but I am still the man of the house. <laughs> um, so what happens is they become possessions. And ancient, uh, most of the ancient cultures had that. But somehow, Israelites were a little bit better for them the wife was the special kind of a possession. They were considered to be most valued possession. Okay, that's the difference. Other cultures and Hebrew culture, the other culture sees a possession. Hebrew culture, most valued possession. But anyway, women were treated that way and Jesus standing for the victimized because a man could do anything. So women could be exploited. And Jesus says, I will not condone it. I'm going to stand against it. I will not allow women to be objectified. So today in the modern world, we, we talk about equality. And therefore, the other thing also could be true. Okay, live in a modern world, right? I'm for all, I'm all for equality, right? Men could objectify women, women could objectify men. God says, no, no, you cannot. People are people. They are not supposed to be used. So let's not be people who only think about our desires, our happiness, our pleasure, our joy, but never considering other people as people. If that is the case, Jesus says, do not do it because that is as dangerous and as bad as adultery is, right? Then he goes on, 29, if your right eye causes you to stumble, Gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Okay, this is a kind of a very, 
you know, gory kind of an imagery, right? So if the first thing I call, you know, we know it is about adultery. The second one is about appeasement. Here he is saying, what is more important to you? This is a very gory picture. Okay, just think about that. Your right eye does something wrong. You pull it out. Oh, <laughs> but it is not literal, right? But Jesus is trying to say it's not literal. He, Jesus always uses, many times he uses something called hyperbole, okay? Which means exaggeration. Why does he use that? For example, he would say, you know what, a hundred sheep are there and one sheep gets lost. And immediately, the good shepherd, his heart goes out to that one sheep. So 99, he will leave it where it is, where they are. And then he, go, he goes in search of the one. Is it fair or, for, or on, the, uh, on the part of the shepherd to do that to the 99? Because the 99 are just on the roadside, okay? No safety. And he goes in search of the one. Would you do that? <laughs> you would first say, hey, 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 99. Yeah, one is important. But let me safeguard this one, right? So that is fair. So Jesus would certain times exaggerate to make a point. For example, in the, the, the widow who's lost the silver coin, remember that? The coin, she searches for it. And then she finds it. And immediately she calls all her neighbors and says, let's throw a party, okay? Yeah, one coin you got, and you're throwing a party, spending I don't know how many <laughs> coins. Yeah, it's an exaggeration, right? Exaggeration to make a point. It's called hyperbolic, right? Jesus uses this where he says, you know, be very careful of how you process. See, we all have sensory organs, right? That's how we get input. Yes, just because you remove that sensory organ does not mean you have removed sin because biblical teaching is that sin is not there in the body. How many of you know that? And that is why we talk about the soul. When we talk about redemption, we are talking about something not just about the body, but something within which makes us human, where that makes us, that gives us life. You understand that? And when sin came into existence, it was not just corrupting the body, it, was, it actually corrupted what was inside that made, made us humans, right? So taking just one sensory organ and throwing it into the fire or cutting it off is not going to do anything at all because you inside have not changed. So what Jesus is saying is that it is better that you don't, you filter things out. Okay, my eyes are there and I need to be putting a filter where I don't fill it with ugly things because that gets processed in my mind. You understand that? So process, see, the, the, what happens in your thought process is much more important than, because you can't avoid anything. You see that? You know, as you walk on the road, you know, can you shut your eye? Can you, you know, uh, uh, shut your ears? Can you do anything? No, no, no. You can't. But you filter things out, you process them rightly. This is very important that Jesus is talking about. How is it for us? You know, today, instead of doing that, we try to flagellate ourselves. We try to punish ourselves. That is a criticism. You know, even Christians do that. They think, you know what? I think I've been a you know, bad person. Maybe through the week I will fast. You know why? Because by, you know, we take it out of context. I beat my body into obedience. Right? None of you do that. Thank God for that. But at least do the right thing. The next one, it's not just about flagellating and, you know, making your body suffer because asceticism works that way. They thought that matter in itself is evil and this body becomes a prison for you. You have to be redeemed out of the body and therefore it's okay to crush the body, you know. And uh, if, you, if at all you fast, don't ever have this idea that you're crushing your body to make it pleasing to God. You can never do that. This is something that God has given, given. And therefore, you have no right to destroy your body. You understand that? Take care of it well. That is very, very important. What Jesus is talking about is that you, how do you process things? Okay, how do you process things? Is your mind making you do things? Because God says, be very careful about your thought. Good ideology, you feed it in your mind and then you will not be. Right? You see the same thing, right? You see, you see the same thing. Two people see the same thing. And one person is empathetic about it. One person is insensitive towards that. You see an accident that has happened. One person is taking a selfie there and the other person is running to help that person out. They have seen the same thing. 
It's the process that needs to change. You understand that? So be very careful that you're always sensitive, that you feed your mind with noble, lofty things, teachings of the scripture, the law, which make you, you see things, but how do you process? Are you become a destructive force in the world or are you a constructive force in the world? Are you doing something better for the society? Are you making it worse? It all depends on not what you see. It all depends on how you process it and how you make your actions make a difference difference in the world that you live in. You understand that? So this is the idea. You know, gouging, maybe your eyes might be easier. I don't know. It is tough. But even that is not going to help because even people who maybe have lost their, you know, some senses in their body, are they saints now? You understand that? The flesh is not what makes you sinful. It's your, the nature that makes you sinful. May God help us that we will change our nature, that we will become loving, we will become caring, we will become compassionate, and also be very careful that you don't expose yourselves too much to unwanted things, because that also, you know, makes your brain think that is the norm. You understand that? The more bloodshed you th that you see, what makes it, your, 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 your brain becomes dull to that. More violence you see, it makes you Dull to it. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So be very careful that you don't expose yourself to unnecessary things because that also, what happens is, it makes you think that, it, that is, this is the norm. So you have seen so many accidents, you, you have seen so many people die that it doesn't make any you know, kind of an impact on you when you see someone dying. You know, this is the world that we are moving to, let me tell you, right? And especially with the photographs, you know, people standing near, you know, something that happened to somebody and taking photographs. How is it even human? Where is humanity gone? And you will be saying, hey, I'm exaggerating. No. I saw a video where a woman is being pinned down under the wheels of a train and a guy has the, I don't know what that is, he has the audacity, he has the insensitivity to take a selfie as this woman is pinned under the wheels of a train. I'm not exaggerating. I know it's graphic. We want to just take it out of our mind. But if that doesn't disturb you, let me tell you, there's something wrong with you. Change your nature. This is what the world is coming to. May God help us that we will you know, have this godly nature, fill yourself with good ideology that you will know, hey, this is not something that I'm going to condone. So you know, losing one part of your body is not going to help you, but how you process what you get in through these sensory organs and how you react to that is what makes you whether you are a part of the kingdom or not part of the kingdom. No, we talked about that. 31 onwards, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now he goes on talking about that how certain people have used the law to, for their own benefit. We talked about adultery, we talked about appeasement, how we should be not using people, but uh, you know, respecting people, never appease yourself, right? We talked about how uh, uh, we need to assess what is, what is important. We need to assess the, the information that comes into you through the sensory organs, so I call it assessment. And the fourth thing, in the Old Testament, a man can divorce his wife, verse, uh, that is Deuteronomy 24.1, I don't have time to read it, go home and read it, maybe Deuteronomy 24.1, a man can divorce his wife if he finds something indecent about her. You know, that's the, that's the actual quote. If he finds something indecent about her, he can divorce her, but he has to first produce a certificate of divorce, which was not just like, you know, we think oh, he can write it and give. No, there were certain legal things that had to be done. Uh, there was a body which was governing and they could go and say, you know, this is the well, cause, this is the reason for which I, am, I'm, I don't want to have this person in my life. And they would check the reasons and if it was found to be right, then she would be divorced, okay? Why is the law of divorce put in place? So that... Why is the law of divorce put? Is it from the Bible? Yeah, God gave the commandment? No, he did not. The devil gave the commandment. <laughs> no, these are from, from the Bible. But it is given so that the victim could be safeguarded. You understand that? Not for the exploiter. Never. No law is ever for the exploiter. The law is always for the 
victim so that no one can should be victimized okay so it is a way out for a person who is uh, you know in a relationship where the other person keeps on committing adultery and therefore you you know the one person is being victimized and therefore there needs to be a way out so it is always for it is not the ideal but it is the way out you know that's the escape right it's the almost the fire exit you don't use it all the time right <laughs> You get it? Yeah. You don't open the fire exit every time you go out, want to go out. No, that's in case of emergency. It's, it's there as a safeguard, right? But what people do is in the Old Testament, as I told you, because it's not very clear. It says something indecent. And there were two, uh, two views, two schools of thought, basically, two rabbis. You know, I want to, this is interesting. Two rabbis. One is called Shammai, this man, you know, he has a school, he has a following school, meaning a thought, a way of thinking, a way of, uh, an ideology, it's not a school per se, right? We call it a school of thought. Shammai, who was living in the first century, you know, somewhere around first century BC, right? Somewhere around that time, maybe around 100 BC. Uh, so you find that this man said that uh, this word, which says something indecent, signifies nothing less than unchastity or adultery. And argued that only this crime justified a man divorcing his wife. But there was also another group. When this man, this group was led by Hillel. He was also a contemporary of Shammai. And he said, if she finds no favor in his eyes, is what the Bible actually says before the indecent thing. He says, if, he, if she finds no favor in his eyes and he finds something indecent in her, he can divorce her. So they took, take this and emphasize this. And they said, divorce should be granted for the flimsiest reasons such as spoiling of a dish. When you cook, you spoil the dish, done, right? Or burning the dish or careless seasoning. Okay, you put some salt and you, you do it, overdo it, you spoil the dish, you know what? For any reason. And some of the rabbis boldly taught that a man had a perfect right to dismiss his wife if he found another woman whom he liked better or who was more beautiful. Okay, these are rabbis, okay? You see that? First century rabbis. So now the problem comes as to, you need to be careful. Yeah, victim cannot remain the victim all the time, but the law cannot be used to support the exploiter who really wants to ditch his wife, right? And all that he loses is just the bride price, okay? And therefore it's easy for him, right? And uh, if it, we, the, the law is being used by these people as a loophole, they find this loophole and try to, some men want to exploit it, and Jesus says, no, 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 you cannot do it unless for the right reasons. So I call it an artifice or a trick to deceive. Let's not be people who use the law to find some loophole through which we escape, but look at the intent of the law. The law is always supportive of the victim. So may God help us that we will be people who understand all of these things. Yes, there is a way out for a victim, but don't be the exploiter is the lesson that we learn. And obviously, the teaching of Jesus also teaches us about forgiveness, and therefore, there is an aspect of forgiveness that we could give chances to people that is also definitely there. But what we are trying to say, what Jesus is saying is, you can never exploit anybody even using the law. Because the law is there to support, to safeguard from further victimization. So Jesus says, don't use even the law to, you being an exploiter, you cannot use the law to escape the punishment, to escape and still continue with your victimization. You know, these are things that Jesus taught, okay? So what have we understood? In a covenant relationship, never break the covenant relationship, never be the exploiter, never be the adulterer. And you... Even though we have needs, we have desires, always understand that people, persons are persons. They are not objects to satisfy your desires. Appeasement is not the important thing. Love is the important thing. And therefore, be careful that you don't covet, you don't lust. Then we talked about assessment that Jesus is talking about, that you need to be careful as to assess what is right, what is wrong, have your right ideology, so that just because you get something through your sensory perception into your mind does not mean you have to act negatively on it, but rather process it rightly so that the action will never be negative, it will be positive. Fill your mind with right ideology, the right teachings of Jesus, whereby you will be able to safeguard yourself. You see things, but you're not acting 
acting on it because you, are, you might be acting on it positively, but you should not be acting on it negatively because you have the right ideology. Assess what is right, what is wrong. Otherwise, you are in danger of being separated from God himself because God's nature, you want to be, you want to have the nature of God so that you can have a relationship with God and eternal life is all about that. Salvation is all about that. My relationship with God. Am I, be, am I able to grow like him, become like him? If I don't have his understanding, if, if God is saying, hey, person is a person, I consider that person as an object, then obviously I am far away from God and it automatically means that I'm not a part of the kingdom assess rightly and the last thing he talks about is the artifice it is basically a trick to deceive you use an existing law for to justify what you do you are the exploiter but you want to find some words in the bible to justify what you do don't ever do that because that is not what the law is given for the law is given only for the victim to be safeguarded and protected and not for the exploiter to. If we are exploiters in any of those things, repent, may God help us, that we will make changes here. None of us are perfect, but this is a message that Jesus gives so that we, could, we have life, we have you know, enough time for us to repent and make changes in our lives, whereby we truly can say, I have the heart and mind of God and I am united with Christ because we think alike, I have his nature. May God help us, let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer.